let's make a start. Dr. Lake, would you like to just briefly introduce yourself? Um, tell us what you do. Yeah, Thanks. hi. Uh, my name's Ian Lake. I'm a GP in um, in the UK. I, I, I work um, in, you know, in, in all disciplines of, of, of medicine as, as a GP, but my main interest really um, as, as a subspeciality really is metabolic disease. Um, and, and metabolic health, um, which is obviously t takes a lot of our time. The chronic diseases uh, take a lot of GP time. And I believe that most of them are manageable with, with uh, diet and lifestyle measures. I, I hate to use the word diet. Um, I think it's a, a lifestyle. It's just a matter of fueling your body in the right way for your particular uh, genetics, I suppose. And also in, in the way that respects the way our bodies work. And, and I think our fueling of our body has been um, inaccurate for, for a long, long time because we, we've assumed that the nutrients we, we take um, are required in, in, in my view, the wrong quantities, the wrong proportions. I have type one diabetes myself and I, I have had that now for 28 years. So I'm headed that way, if you see what I mean. But um, I, had a revelation eight years ago when I'd read Richard Bernstein's book. And if any of you have type one in this group, Richard Bernstein is sort of recognized as the, the trailblazer of, of low carbohydrate ketogenic um, metabolism for type one diabetes. And it absolutely revolutionized my management of type one diabetes. And I've sort of never looked back and the learning after um, day one of a good diabetes control um, led me to getting involved in many um, aspects of metabolic disease, pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, obviously type 1 diabetes, um, migraines, um, mental health generally, um, and it's producing good results. Unfortunately, the uh, official channels don't recognize uh, this uh, in the way I think they should. So a lot of people aren't getting given the options of dietary and lifestyle management, which would benefit them. So here I am um, trying to provide the information so people at least have a choice in, in how they manage their health uh, in a different way to often medication. And I think this would be a great time to just mention the programs that you've got available and not just for the public, but also for your medical colleagues to give them some confidence around low carb and diabetes. Yeah, thank you. Um, my, my main interest and in, um, my main speciality is type one diabetes. And I find it um, insightful really that a lot of doctors are very unconfident in dealing with uh, type 1 diabetes, especially diabetologists who are worried about the effect of, of uh, the word ketosis, really, and nutritional ketosis and diabetic ketoacidosis. And I think there's a lot of confusion around that. And, and also the idea that if you're taking insulin, you have to take carbohydrates. Um, it, it, it is true that if you are hypo, you have to take carbohydrates. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, but you can manage your insulin well. I mean, type one diabetes is a condition of lack of insulin. It's not a lack of the right sort of food. Diabetes requires hormone replacement in the form of insulin. And the way, the way we use our insulin, we put it into the wrong place for a start. We don't put it into the pancreatic uh, circulation. We put it into our skin. And because of that, it behaves slightly differently. It's remarkable that it keeps us alive for so long. Um, but my view is that Insulin in an overuse situation, in an overuse scenario, is causing long-term harm. And a lot of the complications of type 1 diabetes are caused by not just high sugar levels, but equally high insulin levels. So I've tried to produce a course for uh, healthcare professionals, which is CPD accredited, so it's accredited for professional training, uh, to understand what keto lifestyles are about in type 1 diabetes in the hope that patients will get the opportunity to have information around um, other ways of managing their diabetes other than cramming in a whole load of sugar. And of course, it makes sense, doesn't it? If, you, if you're taking a, a, a hormone that reduces your blood sugar, you will obviously need something that raises your blood sugar, but you can manage it much more subtly than that. 
and get your insulin volumes down by at least half the majority of people do. They reduce their hypo frequency sixfold. And that's according to good research evidence. And that's a, that that is reproducible evidence. And they just do well generally. And they normalize their blood glucose and get their diabetes. 95% of people on a keto diet in type 1 diabetes achieve the normal non-diabetic range for their, for their long-term sugar control, which is remarkable. When you consider that in the UK, 70% of type ones are losing a hundred days of life every single year because of their diabetes control. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is not really, in my view, acceptable. No, it's quite, it's, the forces. it's quite criminal that we allow that to happen really, you know, mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that. I've got tons of questions here. Great. Nice to meet everyone. And I hope yeah. I can answer your questions um, in a, I, a useful can, way for you. I can turn everyone's pictures on. So thanks everyone for coming. I've let lots and lots of you into the waiting room. But with previous Q&A recordings that I have then published broadly, I've had a couple of people say that they weren't comfortable about their um names and, and and photos you know their images being on the public recordings that went out to the public so I figured out how to use the mode where I switch that off if anyone would like to be in the picture please just um text me in the chat and I can turn it on but otherwise um yeah it, it does feel a bit weird not to have all the faces lined up there doesn't it <laughs> Anyway, please um, just message me in the chat if you've got questions. And um, I've been, I've got a few apologies and I've got a couple of questions from those people. So I'll start with them and then I'll get to the questions that come up in the chat. So the first question is from Sarah, but not our Sarah here. <laughs> and Sarah, if you have questions, please jump in and ask as well, because you may have questions that come from what you deal with with your clients and that would be really helpful also so Sarah has sent me a few of her blood results and she said are there any potential risks for someone with type 1 diabetes um, basically doing low carb how would they start and how do they manage their insulin so she's on an insulin pump and okay. wanted to know what to do um, around food. And she told me her, she said her HbA1c is 53 millimoles per litre. Yeah. Her triglycerides are 2.7. Yeah. Uh, total cholesterol is 11. LDL is 6.9. HDL is 1.4. She's 40 years old. She's on statins. Her blood pressure is 160 over 95. She's five foot six and she weighs 82 kgs. So Sarah, thanks yeah. for all that information. That's really helpful. <laughs> so presumably Sarah hasn't started on a low carbohydrate lifestyle as yet. So no. these are the figures we have with, with what I'd assume is a, is a, a, a typical um, diet of about half the diet coming from healthy carbohydrates and um, about 15% of it coming from protein. Um, so with low carb, there's nothing unusual for a person who has type one diabetes. There's nothing new to learn. It's, it's, it's redoing what you already know. So the first day in, in type one diabetes, you, you get told to take a basal insulin dose, which covers all of the, the background functions that are happening in your body to raise sugar. So things like stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol, if your sugar's going low, you, you can produce glucose uh, uh, from uh, other tissues and you can also break down uh, a glycogen store, which is basically a sugar store in your body. So the idea is to take basal insulin to cover all that and you take uh, long acting insulin uh, once or twice a day uh, with the pump, you set a basal rate so in, a, in a pump. You have rapid acting insulin all the time. You set a basal rate uh, and then you count your carbohydrates and possibly your protein, uh, definitely carbohydrates. And then you estimate the amount of insulin you require and shoot up the insulin um, at the 
appropriate time to catch the sugar rise when you eat the food in your bloodstream. So that's pretty basic type one diabetes management. Everybody should know that, but a lot of people don't really don't apply it because it's quite hard work every day uh, counting carbohydrates in food. So people estimate and uh, just inject what they think, which is fine. So there's no difference if you reduce your carbohydrates. So you need to get your basal level right. Uh, your basal dose set correctly on your pump. And with a pump, it, it's a little bit of trial and error, but it, it, whatever you're doing at the moment is probably about right, um, I would say. Uh, and then you count your carbohydrates and, and bolus your insulin with a pump except when you're having 300 grams of carbohydrates a day, say you're taking one unit of insulin for every 10 grams of carbs, so you'll be taking uh, 30 units of insulin a day. Um, and if you're having 30 grams of carbohydrates a day, you'll be using three units of insulin per day, if you see what I mean. Now, one unit of insulin reduces blood glucose by a variable amount, depending on how long you've had diabetes and depending on what sort of type one you have. And I, I might come on to that a bit later, because I think everyone's slightly different in, in the way their type one expresses itself. I always say there are 400,000 people in the UK with type one and there are 400,000 ways of managing it. So whatever is happening to you, Sarah, is, is, is your unique diabetes profile. However, the principles are the same. Uh, so if you're ha only having 30 grams, you're taking three units of, of insulin and one unit of insulin will reduce your blood glucose by about between two and three millimoles per litre. So you can see that if you're only taking three units of insulin per day uh, uh, to cover your food, uh, you're going to get a maximum of about nine millimoles per litre decrease in your blood glucose over a 24 hour period, which is tiny, isn't it? If, if be practical about it. So if your blood glucose is, is 20, it'll bring it down to only 11. However, if you're on 10 times that amount of insulin, you can imagine you, you've got to manage your sugar much more effectively because the insulin is always trying to crash your glucose down. So that's the basis of, of, of diabetes management. So with a, with a low carb diet, you just count your carbs. The, the trick I think it, with um, type one and basal assessment is to fast. Really. So what we need to do is to say, well, what exactly is my requirement for uh, basal insulin? Now, it changes. First of all, you have to accept that it changes. So if you're busy during the day, if you're going out walking all day, you may have too much in basal insulin on board. On a pump, it's much easier to set that rate than it is if you just put it in with pens. Um, but the principle is that you fast over a 24 hour period, hopefully two 12 hour periods and if you should have a continuous glucose meter, really, and I think most people do have, if you don't, you should be testing your blood, your finger prick blood sugars at least every half an hour just throughout that period. So make sure you got enough sticks and also have some glucose tablets just in case you go low. But you, you say you wake up in the morning um, uh, and have nothing to eat until eight o'clock in the evening, say, and then you monitor your blood glucose, you inject your basal and monitor your blood glucose the idea is to get a flat trace between four and six uh, or slightly lower probably but for, between four and six is acceptable um, throughout that 12 hour period and then you can have your food whatever you want and, and inject the insulin accordingly or, or bolus for that insulin so if your blood glucose is rising throughout that fasting period clearly you don't have enough basal insulin and if your blood glucose is falling you have too much basal insulin so the next time you do that in that morning period and that daytime period, you will adjust your basal to, to enable to try to get a flat trace. And then you do the same in the, in the evening. So stop eating at eight o'clock at night, saying go right through till eight o'clock the next morning and extend it even longer if you can. And uh, set your alarms on your um, CGM, your continuous glucose meter, or make sure you're measuring at least hourly throughout the night. You tend to get less spikes throughout the night because basal doesn't act in such an aggressive way. And again, you're trying to get a, a flat profile. The thing about overnight fasting is that you may get a spike in the morning uh, and that isn't due to anything to do with your basal. It's due to the fact that your blood glucose is going up as a result of, of, of the waking process and the way the hormones change as we wake. And what I encourage people with pens to do is just use a, a rapid acting insulin to cover that because it tends to, to decrease relatively quickly. 
And if you're on a pump, you, you can obviously bolus for that one to two units, whatever suits you. And, and, and that's the way to do it. So once you've got your basal set, you've got total freedom of when you eat. You can go all day without eating if you want to. You can have two meals a day. You can have one meal a day. You can have three meals a day. You can have snacks if you want. Um, but then you've got total control of, of your dietary pattern. With, with a keto lifestyle, we try to encourage maximum of two meals a day and, and longer periods of, of not eating. So a keto lifestyle is ideal for, for people like yourself who, who, who want to, to go keto and manage your insulin because your insulin volumes, um, so, sorry, your insulin sensitivity improves when you're not eating, as, you, as I'm sure you know, Sarah, that um, when you're not eating, it's the best diabetes control you can get. However, <laughs> you know, it's not sustainable, is it, at all? So you eat the same amount of calories overall. Um, you probably find you're eating slightly fewer, but you, you change the balance of, the, of, of where those calories come from in favour of fats and protein, uh, and you cut down your carbohydrates. So when you have your, your first meal after a fast and it's keto, you just bolus your insulin to suit the amount of carbs in that diet. As you get going, you'll be bolusing for protein as well. And with the pump, protein is much, much easier because you'll notice that protein gives you a later sugar spike. Uh, it's more of a plateau than a spike. Uh, and there's an art really to getting the protein amounts right. And I find that quite difficult depending on how much physical activity you're doing what stage of life your body's in. If you're in a growing phase, you'll probably need more protein. And if you're in a sedentary phase, you'll probably need less protein, but our bodies will always need protein to, to build and repair tissue. So just to summarize then, you get your basal level right by fasting, and then you count your carbs and, and bolus for your, your insulin to suit your carbs and your protein. So you should have an idea of your insulin to carb ratio. So there's only two calculations you need for, for, for type one really, is your insulin to carb ratio. So how much insulin do you need per 10 grams of carbs or whatever, one unit of insulin for however many grams of carbs. And that's sort of easy to work out by, uh, by trial and error, isn't it? But it we, most people start off at one to 10. Children will probably start off at one to 20 or even one to 30. And when you get older and crustier, you'll probably go less than 10. So once you've got that calculation, you can calculate your carbohydrates. For protein, you, you, you halve that amount. So it's, if it's one to 10 for carbs, it's about one to 20 for protein. So that's quite significant when you're eating more protein in your diet. So just because you're not eating carbs doesn't mean you won't be taking insulin. You'll just be taking insulin to cover the protein, not the carbs. Because as um, you may be aware, protein does right, raise blood sugar. And, and in fact, protein is, is a valuable source of sugar people on a, on a keto diet um, and the other calculation you need is your insulin sensitivity if you inject one unit of insulin how much does it drop your blood glucose by um, it's normally between two and three children can be very sensitive it can be even one to ten one to twenty even it can drop very quickly certainly in the early stages of diabetes and as you tend to get more insulin resistant with age and length of time you've had diabetes and been injecting more insulin than your body really, really needs, you'll probably, your, your insulin sensitivity will probably decrease to sort of one-to-one uh, -one sometimes. So once you've got those calculations on board, you, you're completely safe. You, 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 you've got your basal level set. You can choose when to eat uh, and you know how much you, insulin you need to keep you safe and uh, just purely for the food. And you know how much insulin you need to make a correction dose. So for example, if your blood glucose is 15 and you want to bring it down to, to eight, uh, that's, that's too difficult for me, no, it's seven. Okay, and your insulin carb ratio is one to two point, your insulin sensitivity drops it by 2.5, clearly three units of insulin will drop it by seven and a half, and that will get you somewhere where you need to be. And, and that's pretty well, I think what you need to do, I think your HbA1c is on the, the, the lowish side, but I think you can get that down uh, into the 40s, uh, with relative ease and you may find that your ratio of fats will alter in favor of reduced triglycerides and increased hdl which are the, the ones we're looking for however with um a, a keto diet um the cholesterol the total cholesterol level may go up a little bit and the ldl may go up a little bit um 
but overall the profile is is towards a healthy state and i'll talk about that a bit if you want depending on what the questions are uh, and hopefully as your insulin volumes reduce which they almost certainly will um your blood pressure will come down because insulin uh, preserves salt in your system and that uh, makes the blood pressure go up which is obviously why uh, there's a recommendation to reduce salt on a, a normal diet because you know salt retention causes high blood pressure but you will not get salt retention in a keto diet so you don't need to worry too much about your salt is that okay yeah that's fantastic thank you that's a whole lecture in itself that one sarah thank you yeah i know it's <laughs> too much for everybody's brain is completely frazzled already i was very <laughs> impressed with the depth of question that you sent me and the information it's very helpful actually to have such good questions all right Ellis says, what are some strategies to transition to low carb diet while managing type 2 diabetes? She's insulin dependent on statin and metformin. So I guess similar to what you suggested for Sarah, there would be some crossover there. Yeah. The key, the key worry for us GPs in the UK is that we cannot get routinely the tests we need. So if you if you have type 2 and are taking insulin, what we need to know if you're transitioning to low carb is, do you need that insulin or not? So I think about 70% off the top of my head of people who are taking insulin in type 2 can, can get rid of it. However, there are a proportion of people in whom pancreatic function over years and years and years and the pancreas is where your insulin is made uh, pancreatic function deteriorates due to years and years of, of, of high blood sugars and inflammation caused by the type 2 diabetes the metabolic upset so those people will will probably need insulin so it, it's a balanced it's a, it's a balance really of, of judgment on this one um, we can typically when people start to go keto, we typically halve the insulin dose uh, quite quickly and then halve it again about two to three weeks later, depending on what is happening to the person's blood glucose. Um, and we, some people go straight or straight into keto. So they go from like 300 grams to 30 grams overnight. If you need insulin, um, that will work quite well for you. If, if you Sorry, if you don't need insulin, that will work quite well because you can reduce your insulin volumes quite quickly um, uh, and nothing will happen to you. However, if you do need insulin and stop your insulin, um, then you may get into trouble uh, with a ketoacidosis um, caused by a relative lack of insulin in your body. And that will force your body to burn fat. But you will notice your blood sugars will go up at the same time as that. So if people are insulin dependent, it needs a skilled um, practitioner to, to help you to manage that. And we need to know, do you have insulin on board um, that you can produce? So if we do reduce your insulin volumes, is that safe? Um, that's our main worry in general practice. In the majority of cases, as I say, we, 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 we do quite well. And we always give our patients keto sticks to, to test for ketones when, when they're going through this process just to be absolutely sure, because they're out there. You, you, can't, you can't just keep ringing people up every five minutes and they need to understand that. Um, with respect, to, uh, so it, it's the same strategy otherwise, ex, uh, except I think most people with in, on insulin dependent um, type two diabetes are, are tend to be on long acting um, insulin. Um, some people have bolus insulin, so short acting as well. Uh, and if that's the case, I, I would get a, a measure done called your C-peptide. Now, C-peptide is a tiny protein that is associated with insulin. Uh, and if your body's making it, you'll tend to have high C-peptide levels in type 2 diabetes. If your body's not making it, uh, your C-peptide levels will be low. And that is a good marker for whether your body's producing insulin or not. In my experience, the majority of people with type 2 diabetes are producing more than enough insulin. So the added insulin, which doesn't contain C-peptide, the added insulin is probably superfluous to most people's needs, especially when they drop their, their diet to the, the metabolically sympathetic. You get a metabolic advantage with, with cutting your carbs if you have type 2 diabetes. Because type 2 is really caused by a genetic vulnerability to overfueling with carbs, effectively. So with respect... Oh, sorry, sorry, go on. 
No, oh, I was just going to ask a couple of questions, but carry on. I'll ask them at the end. Yeah, I, I, I personally would, would seek help from someone who knows what they're doing in your area, because I think you need this to be managed down properly. If you weren't on insulin, I think it'd be an easier strategy. But we just need to be careful with the insulin. It, it's, it, I wouldn't over worry about it because you, I'm sure you're probably going to be one of those people that, that will just come off insulin. But there are a portion of people that can't. Um, so you just got to be careful with, with what you read. And, and from a clinician's point of view, the last thing we want is to obviously harm our patients by, by being a bit too cavalier and enthusiastic for our cause. So care is required and get somebody who knows what they're doing. Is somebody um, in this room who in this um, video room who knows what they're doing. Um, with respect to metformin, it's, it's a very good drug, really. Um, uh, it, it does increase your insulin sensitivity by, by getting your cells to, to burn sugar. But over time, you may well be able to come off that. Um, statins, they're a real hot potato, aren't they? I'll talk about statins if you want, um, but that, that's a completely different argument. Mm. But if you want me to talk about it, I will. Um, I think that would be good. I'll get through a couple more questions and then maybe okay. we'll yeah. come on to statins at the end. Yeah. yeah. But it, <laughs> just with Ellis and just with people in general, type two diabetics in general, do you, do you like them to um, go straight into a keto diet or do you think that they can gradually reduce or just, is that individual depending on the person? Yeah. I think Sarah is probably a better place to answer that than me, but individual uh, is the thing. I think a lot of people are, have a emotional or a, 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 yeah, an emotional relationship with food. Um, and some people have great difficulty getting off carbohydrates. And I think for those people, they probably need to slow it down a little bit. My preference is to go straight in. The reason for that uh, and there are a couple of drugs which you have to be careful with. Uh, insulin is one of them and one called uh, uh, sulfonylurea. In this country, it's called glyclozide, glibenclamide, all those sort of drugs. Um, but the reason I, I'm quite keen for people to go straight in is because if they understand what their body is doing, and that just requires some education as to how me metabolism works, um, they will get good benefits after three weeks and the majority of us even myself can concentrate for three weeks if i was required to, to go longer i'd probably get bored uh, or just not believe in it so at three weeks most people have got some good weight loss some good sugar control and they're feeling great uh, and then they can decide where they pitch their sugar their, their carbohydrate intake because some people obviously with type 2 will get away with just halving their carb intake some people will require a lot more carbohydrate reduction in order to get where they want to be so my preference would be for people who are, who are safe and not on drugs that well if they're on drugs that compromise i'll get them to stop those drugs but if they're on insulin i'll have to manage it down uh, my preference would be to educate people initially to go straight into keto but there are you know some people just can't do it because they they, they like their bread or whatever you know, so they, it, 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 you know, however much education and will you've got, if you, there are times for all of us when our willpower is, is, is called upon and, and we don't have it. And uh, I think we have to be sympathetic to that. Mm -hmm. And, and don't, don't be disappointed if you don't make it first time around. Because you know, for, for smokers, it takes six or seven goes at abstinence to try to get it right. And same for alcoholics. So for carboholics, it's probably somewhere in that region for all of us. And then I think there's also that difference between harmful use of carbohydrates and being an addict. And, you know, my understanding of like Bitt and Johnson's work and um, yeah. some of the other carb addict um, people is that there's quite a different approach between the two. And with a carb addict, you can't gradually reduced you just have to stop mm. cold turkey basically <laughs> which is that sarah to that because you're you're running courses at the moment aren't you on type two yeah anything to add i think you're on yeah. mute sarah i am i'm you now yeah so my program that i do in my business is i pretty much treat everyone like addicts and i tell them this when they come to me because they generally are addicted to sugar and so I always say to them, you know, if you have a heroin addict, you're not going to say you can have heroin on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays as a treat. Because some people can have guilt-free meals 
when changing their lifestyle and still see good results if they're not carb addicts. They don't have a bad relationship with carbs. But the clients that come to me generally do have a problem with that. So we have to remove it all. You know, no artificial sweeteners. We don't replace any sugar with keto treats. There's none of that. The only thing that they sort of have that is a little bit sweet is maybe some berries. Um, but even then, they tr they even try not to go there because they don't even want to taste that sweetness because it can send them, you know, off having wanting more. So I find that the first two weeks is the hardest for them because they are going through withdrawal and they're going through the keto flu. And, you know, and I just help them with electrolytes and having the salt and, and pushing through having the fat, um, trying to get the fat based hormones going again and just they're feeling full, they're not hungry. Um, magnesium, all that kind of stuff they need, and they've got the group around them to support them. Once they're over that hurdle, they find it quite easy. Like they just, and by the end of the 12 weeks, they're not craving that sugar again. And then a lot of them make that conscious decision not to go back and even have a treat because they know that they just can't. And other people find that they can have the odd thing and it's not, they're more metabolically flexible and they can up their carbs a little and it's not sending them off you know, into this vicious cycle. One meal's not, one cheat meal's not turning into the whole week or two weeks or three weeks. And they have to kind of figure that out themselves later on. <laughs> yeah. Have, do you, do both of you use continuous glucose monitors? Uh, yep. I order that. They order just the little um, kiosens, the ketone and, and glucose. And we start testing around the six week mark. We use ketone strips in the beginning just to see that they're I don't want them to give them too much in the beginning. I just want them to get used to eating this new way. And then after six weeks, we start testing the ketones and the glucose and yeah, seeing how they're going. Just curious because I see lots of people because I, you know, blueberries are one of the go-tos and yeah. I've been amazed at how much blueberries can spike some people's glucose, but not other people's glucose. And that's quite fascinating. So I think um, testing yourself and knowing how you respond to food is really important. Yeah. Thanks for that. All right. Now I have a question from Brian. So Brian wants to know what he can share with his doctor about low carb for type 1 diabetes. He's telling me to eat five to six small meals a day, low fat, lots of fruit and vegetables. Brian eats that. <laughs> yeah. That's what and, Brian's doctor is telling him to do, and he right. he wants to he wants to explore low carb. Okay, well, if if he goes onto my website, I've got a, a pre prepared um, what to do with your annual review because um, what I did on on is www.type1keto.com, and there's a small section there navigating an annual review. That's based on a 140 uh, patient survey of people who are keto. Uh, and its attitudes to of healthcare professionals towards keto, uh, and some common themes come up. I mean, um, fifty percent of healthcare professionals are completely anti uh, low carbon keto and type one diabetes. They they advise against it, which suggests they know something about it. If they're definitely advising against it rather than saying I don't know anything about it, go and find somebody that does, um, which is a bit more honest. Um, but advising against it, at least 85% of the reasons for advising against were invalid. The vast, vast majority of people who advised against uh, had inaccurate information, such as your risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. Carbohydrate is an essential nutrient. Uh, if you're taking insulin, you've got to have carbs, which is only true in hypoglycemic events. It's a fatty diet. It's unsustainable. Uh, it's not in the guidelines, which is true. Um, because in our guidelines in the UK, it, it, they specifically excluded low carb diets from their evidence base. It was specifically excluded as an appendix in there to say that. Um, so it won't be in the guidelines, so they didn't look for it. So what what is in that document um, is the answers to why those things are wrong. It's not it's not based around a confrontational um situation is based around a collaborative situation where you can share your information uh, share accurate information and then come to a conclusion about what might be best for you but there's no point in in my experience just going straight in and saying i'm going to do this you're wrong um because people just put their barriers up 
Mm. It's, it's negotiating, really. Most, most doctors, are, in my experience, are, are not against it, um, certainly in general practice, because they've got experience of, of type 2 diabetes. But in type 1, people are very, very scared of giving advice which might lead to somebody going to hypo or ending up in hospital in diabetic ketoacidosis. The biggest frustration is that diabetic ketoacidosis is associated with the keto diet, which it isn't. There's absolutely no biological, metabolic, or any other reason why somebody in nutritional ketosis with ketones in their blood is at, on, on a keto diet is at risk of ketoacidosis. We're all at risk of ketoacidosis in type 1 diabetes if we get infections mm -hmm. um, or if we fail to take enough insulin uh, at the time we need it, but we're not at risk because of the diet. And, and if that's the only thing that you and your healthcare professional can agree on, that's progress has been made. It's a very common uh, concern of, of healthcare professionals, which is not accurate. Well, I'll just say to Brian, um, we've got Marcus Hawkins and we have Glenn Davis and Reversal um, New Zealand. So those are two um, GPs you can you can contact who specifically work with low carb. Um, we've got Sarah here as well, <laughs> and there are some other doctors around the country. So if you want to flip me an email, I can send you. Um, the names of some of the other low carb doctors that you might be able to work with. But Ian, I thought this might be a good time to touch on cholesterol and statins because I know one of the great fears amongst GPs is they see weight come down, blood pressure improve, all these metabolic markers improve, except the cholesterol goes up. And it seems almost automatic that everybody who is either a type 1 or type 2 diabetic is prescribed a statin so this might be a great time to have a little chat about that okay the reason we're prescribed statins in diabetes is because um, diabetes is associated both types of diabetes associated with a three-fold increase in heart disease and strokes um, so that's not very good so the idea is that we reduce that risk by um, controlling the risk factors smoking blood pressure uh, cholesterol etc um, and of course cholesterol is implicated in heart disease and um, one of the main markers of heart disease vulnerability is something called a low density cholesterol uh, lipoprotein sorry um, which is um, a type of um, fatty substance which is a carrier fat is carrying fat around the body to be stored basically and it, it's it's an immature sort of version of a, of a storage fat uh, on its way out to be stored into the into the tissues. Um, cholesterol, low density cholesterol is implicated in heart disease. Uh, and when you drill down into low density cholesterol, there are two, two types of low density cholesterol. There's, there's uh, fluffy and dense, okay? And fluffy low density cholesterol is, is, is thought to be re um, relatively safe and dense low density cholesterol is thought to be relatively harmful. And, and, and I think that is a, is a Pretty established fact, really, that, that low density lipoprotein is uh, is associated with with um, deterioration in the coronary arteries and and can make you vulnerable to a heart attack, which is basically a blocking of the coronary arteries, or or a stroke, which is a blocking of the the arteries in the brain. Um, so how, how do we deal with this? Well, all of the research, all of the research on the effect of cholesterol and heart disease is based on a high carbohydrate diet which is 50% of the energy comes from carbohydrates. We know that in that situation, a proportion of, our, of, of people are vulnerable to, to type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes, obesity, fatty liver, which is a form of obesity that hasn't come out yet. Um, and we, we think about 60% of people are in that category generally, and probably even more in the, in, in the USA. So we have a situation where the diet itself is creating conditions of inflammation in the body um, caused by too much insulin being produced, caused by too much fuel and mostly fuel in the form of carbohydrates. We know that carbohydrates stimulate insulin and we know that insulin stimulates the production of cholesterol in the body to get the fat moved around the system. Um, so it's the, the, and we know that continual high doses of insulin, which is, which is a, a hallmark of prediabetes and type 2, high levels of insulin in your blood, which is a hallmark of type 2 diabetes and 
pre-diabetes and fatty liver, we, we know that high levels of insulin cause inflammation in the body and it makes your body more likely to suffer from what's called inflammatory damage. And, it, and it's the split in the, the blood vessel in the heart that causes the initial damage which cholesterol then sticks onto. So this idea of a, of a, of a pipe being furred up by fat, which the drugs companies love to promote, uh, is, is just not an accurate picture. You know, if you if you have, you know, if you, you've all seen these pictures on telly. Somebody has a in, full English breakfast, bacon, eggs, and all that, and then two hours later they take, or an hour later they take a blood test and it's full of fat. And and of course it is because the fat's being moved around the body to get it out of the bloodstream into the tissues, the liver, and then the the, the fatty tissues, or to be used for energy. So so of course it is. But f fat in the bloodstream by itself is not dangerous. It's it's low density lipoprotein. It's the small dense lipo low density lipoprotein that is, that is implicated. So we have no evidence how cholesterol operates in the long term <clears throat> with respect to heart disease on a keto diet. What we do know is that on, on a high carbohydrate diet with the, the pattern of eating that most people adopt, which is three meals a day plus or minus snacks, um, cholesterol um, fat is always being mobilized for storage. So 60, 70% of the time when we're eating a typical diet of high carbohydrates, we're, we're storing fat. When you're on a keto diet, you're mobilizing fat to burn it. So the profile of your fats are, will be different when you're on a keto diet, when you're fat burning, your fat is being mobilized to burn for energy compared with when your fat is being mobilized for storage in the liver and then the, the, the fat stores that around our waist and our bottoms under our chins and all that sort of thing. So I, I don't think you can, you can take the evidence from all of the trials that have been done uh, and apply it to keto diets, but I do say there is no evidence that keto diets will reduce your chance of having a heart attack. Statins reduce the chance of having a heart attack on a, a typical high carbohydrate diet in a fat storage situation. They will reduce your cholesterol and they do reduce your risk of having a heart attack so if you've already had a heart attack, this is called secondary prevention. If you've already had a heart attack, or if you're type 1 diabetic, say, um, who are vulnerable to heart attack, and we're treated because our risk is so high, and we're treated as people who have already had a heart attack. If you already had a heart attack and want to prevent another one and take statins for it, so this is people who are cardiac vulnerable because they've already had a heart attack, you take statins. Taking a statin will reduce your risk of one point by 1.2 percent over a five-year period okay that, that that is a fact so statins do work and that 1.2 percent risk if you change the way you interpret the data that will come up to a 30 percent reduction in heart disease risk depending on depending on how you interpret the data but it's the same data it's just a different way of presenting it so we're often taught to present it as as, as are you going to reduce your risk of heart attack by a third you will actually, for you personally as an individual, reduce your risk by 1.2% over a five-year period. For some people, that's worth it, and you have to respect that decision. Um, but I, I say that we don't know what the effect of a keto diet is because the, the way we're mobilising fats is totally different. And then you have to factor in as a person with diabetes that if you're losing 100 days of life every year as a result of poor diabetes control caused by a conventional diet, do you want to gain about five days of life or do you want to gain a hundred days every year? And, and you, only you as an individual can make that balanced judgment. So there's, there's a little bit in it, but statins do work. So if you, if you want to take a statin to reduce your risk of having a heart attack by 1.2% for five years, it's going to work for you. But if you, if you cut your carbs down and increase your amount of fat and get your blood glucose into the, non-diabetic range you will you will gain an extra 100 days per year of life which is a lot every year isn't it so if you you know if you're type 1 diabetic your year starts on the 22nd of april if you're not that well controlled mm. a, lot, a lot of waste Brilliant. about eight to nine years overall for a type 1 it's so that, that's the argument as i see it at the moment mm. there are some people who are vulnerable to to uh, high cholesterol levels, and they're a slightly different category, but there, there aren't many of those out there. Mm. And there are some genetics at play with, with, with making some people more vulnerable to, 
to heart disease and, and that's a different argument again mm. so that's how i see it anyway and so what you were talking about there was the difference between relative risk and actual risk which i think a lot of the people listening i th I, I think are getting quite well educated yeah. on yeah. on mm -hmm. the difference between that i i'm just curious about your thoughts and i don't want to go down the cholesterol um barrel too much because i'd like to stick with the diabetes but just with the cholesterol and the LDL I'm just interested in your thoughts of the role of lipoprotein little a because when LDL is measured like protein little a is measured alongside of that and unless you have you know all those subfractions specifically measured you don't know how much of that you have exactly yeah and then that is actually quite a high risk for heart disease yes more so than actually the normal LDLs. Yes, thank you for pointing that out. We don't measure it over here routinely, but it, yes. if, if you are vulnerable, it, it is a good one to, to measure and, mm. and, and be as well. And because the other thing with that is that statins actually increase your level of lipoprotein little a. So, you know, perhaps that's something that we should be looking at um, in, yeah, in the whole a... big picture. There's someone called Scott Murray, who's a cardiologist in Liverpool in the UK, uh, and he's excellent on um, who he would recommend statins to based on the lipid profile, plus their, their cardiac scans as well. Mm. Not everybody who has uh, high cholesterol will need a statin, mm. but then that's way out of the, the remit of, of what we can do in, in, a, public, uh, in a public health system. Mm. Mm. But Scott I Murray is very good on that. I've made a note of that. Thank you. Um, yeah, and it's not something we talk about a lot over here either. Although I know that the subfractions, you know, there is more interested in measuring those. And people can do that through external sources now rather than, you know, just pay for, pay for them through external. I think, I th yeah, but I think even then, what, what are you going to do about it, if you see what I mean? There are some people who definitely benefit from statins. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's trying to work out what else you're going to do if statins aren't going to work for you and i think it's having a, a lifestyle of low inflammatory foods and cutting your ultra processed foods completely out mm -hmm. um and eating That's got uh, confused, doesn't it? yeah and, and, and exercising well and eating well and probably with some intermittent fasting factored into that i think that would get most people safe enough really so I posed, you and I spoke briefly earlier, <laughs> and there was a question from Leanne. Leanne um, hasn't joined us tonight, so I'm not going to go too much through all her personal details as she's not here to for me to share those. But just based on you were going to have a have a quick look and give some advice. So Leanne isn't diabetic but has lots of hypo she has some other health history that I won't go into has lots of high hypos has ended up in hospital a couple of times with them um, and has had a whole lot of testing so just any thoughts that you may have about that yeah hypos are relatively rare because the body can normally um, normally has many many mechanisms for raising blood sugar um, you, you can produce, you can make sugar from from protein. Um, you can break down sugar stores called glycogen stores to, to make sugar. You you, you can um, increase the sugar level through um, stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline, which works slightly different ways. Um, and you have this hormone called glucagon, which operates to 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 um, stimulate uh, glucose rise to counteract the effect of insulin. There are a few hormones that actually reduce blood glucose and insulin is by far the main one. Um, it's, it's interesting to, 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 to find out how, uh, how often and when this, this person's getting um, the hypos. Is it before a meal or is it after a meal? So or has she been having them for the whole of her life? In which case you might look for a genetic cause for that. No. Mm. Um, some people have she's been having them for the whole of her life. Um, she has. No, no, no. 
so if it's new onset you think well where, where has that come from so the, the commonest cause are, are often um uh, growths in the pancreas which produce more insulin than than you need it's called an insulinoma and i'm sure your doctors would have looked for that mm -hmm. through, through either a scan or measuring insulin levels um you can get um um anti-insulin antibodies um which which are interesting and they don't have to exist just in type 1 diabetes so if you have anti-insulin antibodies it means that um um that's wrong sorry forget it forget all that um no i'm, I'm completely wrong with that um so the commonest cause is is uh, an insulinoma where your body's producing far too much insulin um Apart from the storage dis disorders and, and um, hereditary disorders, there, there aren't that many other causes, really. If you're drinking a lot of alcohol, that can, it, it, that can suppress your natural glucagon levels, uh, and that will make it more difficult for you to get your blood sugar high. Um, but assuming that's not the case, uh, other drugs that it, people are inadvertently taking, although she's not diabetic, she's unlikely to be on drugs that will lower the blood sugar um so and the other thing i'd be keen to know is are these symptomatic hypos or are these hypos that you notice on your continuous glucose meter because mm -hmm. a hypo on a continuous glucose meter doesn't necessarily mean you're having symptoms i mean i can get down i've had been right down to less than two sometimes and felt completely well and at other times at four i've had spots in front of my eyes i couldn't see a thing uh when your brain isn't getting enough sugar for whatever reason so are these hypos symptomatic? Do they make this person unconscious? Of, uh, you, you know, and do they recover when you when you when you have sugar? Um, normally, if you're going low, uh, your body normally makes um, makes enough um, sugar by itself. The other thing for some people is that if they're losing weight relatively quickly, um, that they, they can have a, a relative increase in insulin sensitivity um, as their fat decreases and their the insulin because we're hyper insulinemic when we're type 2 diabetic pre-diabetic or whatever we have more insulin in our bodies than we need to try to keep the sugar levels under control so when we're processing carbohydrates we produce a lot of insulin uh, and when we start to reduce the amount of carbohydrates that insulin um, it can increase our, our sensitivity to 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 hypos um, and some people who are um initially go keto and they're, they're overweight do get uh, hypo symptoms the other people that get hypo symptoms are people who don't eat for a long period of time and they, they did a study on junior doctors who sort of never eat from one day to the next sort of thing on call uh, and a lot of those are having hypo symptoms with, with con con corresponding low blood glucoses mostly due to exhaustion it must be said where they're probably running out of adrenaline and all that sort of thing but th there are you know people do have hypo symptoms um, without any major disease and hopefully this will settle itself down wow. and, but it does and, need investigating if it, if it's to the level where somebody's getting admitted to hospital it does need investigating but if there's no symptoms i wouldn't worry about a blood glucose of three and a half three that's pretty normal really we had someone on a we did a run uh in this country it was a, it was a walk run 100 miles in five days with no food whatsoever uh and does zero calories and what two of our team were wearing continuous glucose meters and one of them had 30 percent of the time with the blood glucose below three and she's completely asymptomatic no symptoms whatsoever so i wouldn't worry too much about your level of sugar on the meter i'd worry more about your symptoms mm, that's uh, that's a really good point and i think also rapid weight loss i know she's lost probably about 25 kgs in the last sort of less than 12 months probably over nine month period or something so that yeah. perhaps that Incredible. that may be impacting on that as the insulin sensitivity starts to come back yeah. mm. fantastic some good some good points there and some things to follow up all right erica wants to know what target level should a type 1 diabetic be aiming for with blood glucose and how much should this rise after meals yeah, um, the, the, the typical target is between four and 10. Um, and that's the target at which people set their what's called time in range, which is the latest sort of um, way to monitor the success of uh, blood glucose control in type one diabetes. So if 
you have a continuous glucose meter, you can work out how, how much time you're spending between those numbers. And that's thought to um, be a better measure than hemoglobin A1C. If you're on a if you're on a typical higher carbohydrate diet, it is more difficult to control your spikes of blood glucose. Um, but they say, don't they, that anything above sort of 7.5 is, is considered a high blood glucose, but I don't think most people actually have type 1 diabetes who are making those rules. Um, and, and no less than 4. Um, but if you're on a keto diet, your target will probably be between somewhere like 3 and 7 or 3.5 and, and 7. Uh, 3 is probably a bit low. I'd say 3.5 and, and 7. Um, and... You know, you shouldn't ever spike really above sort of 10, but most people shouldn't really be spiking above seven. In the real world, a lot of people are spiking above 10 all the time. Uh, and that's because of the impossible task of balancing insulin with carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So cutting carbs will cut your, um, cut your, the swings of blood glucose. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's all individual. I mean, if you get hypos at four, you don't want to be running less than four, if you see what I mean. And then you need to be setting your alarms at that level. If you're driving, you don't want to be headed down to less than four or five, even depending on what the rules are in your country. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's all individual. Some people have hypo sensations if they've had type one for a long time at seven to eight. So yeah. you won't want to be going down to three and a half, four if you're not. If it depends on when you're depends on the lower number depends on what your hypo sensitivity is. Mm -hmm. And can so you do that on a ketogenic diet? Uh, it seems to improve and it seems that you can you can you can go lower, but it's not a target. It's you know, you need to stay safe yeah. but in, in, from experience. You seem to be because the hypos come in much more slowly. Mm -hmm. So you've got more time to become aware of them and deal with them. Mm -hmm. um, but I, th I think people's hypo uh, uh, sensitivity does does improve so you can run slightly lower but I wouldn't recommend running lower. You run to the level which you need. So, mm -hmm. so personally, I would, I would run at about three and a half to four. Below three and a half, I would feel vulnerable. At 4.2, I have had hypos, uh, or the, the awareness of hypos, which would need correcting, even though, you know, and you test them on a finger prick as well as your CGM, and it's still the same. So it's very, very individual. And as I said, 400,000 people have type 1, 400,000 ways of managing it. But generally, the target, you know, you should be aiming around between four and seven, something like that, four and six, three and a half and six, whatever works for you. How long postprandial is that? Would that be two hours postprandial or for the spike? Well, an hour, really. A lot of a lot of people with type one notice that the, the peak goes up quite quickly, and it and it's a it's a definite uh, gradient, and you can tell how quickly it's going to go up. So. An, an hour if you're having protein it will spike probably two to three hours later and plateau for a long long time the other thing i find and a lot of people with type ones find is that saturated fat can actually in can block the expression of insulin so a lot of people get a plateau uh, lasting hours um, uh, where insulin doesn't seem to work so that that's sort of again an overfueling issue um where you've eaten too much fat for that particular for your requirements that time and the fats blocking the expression of insulin and, and don't forget insulin is a is, is a fat metabolizing hormone so that would make sense so that's exogenous insulin that it's blocking or does it do the same yeah. to your to the insulin you produce yourself i don't know i don't know because because the insulin you produce yourself it, it i think there's evidence that that um certain fats um, do cause insulin resistance Mm. you know more about this than me mm. so so it's very variable sorry it's not a, a exact answer but whatever your hypo level is you should be working at one above that at least um if you're on a high carbohydrate diet you need a lot more margin of safety than if you're on a low carbohydrate diet in my opinion but safety is the key here there's no brownie points for running along at three three and a half and having hypos every five minutes or being vulnerable to hypos and, and ditto, you know, I, I, I try to keep your top number below seven and a half, eight, but in practice, that's quite hard work. Mm. Look, we've done an hour. I've still got quite a few questions. Um, I don't know how people feel about staying on for a bit longer. Um, and Ian, I'm not sure where you're at for time. Yeah, I'm all right for another half an hour. 
All right, great. All right, I'll try and zap through them quickly. Sarah, are you all good there? Yep, great. Um, so Quentin commented on, you and I did a podcast a little while ago, and he commented on your fasted running. He's well-controlled type one, and he'd like to begin fasting exercise. So he just wants to know how to start that and what should he look out for? Yeah, thank you. Great. Um, a lot of type ones now are adopting this fast and running because it, it makes your blood glucose control so, so much easier. I think you have to be keto adapted. Um, so you have to have some ketones in your system um, and have good hypo awareness um, and have good control of your basal rate, whether that's on a pump or a pen. So you don't then need if you if your basal rate is 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 fixed, you probably don't need to adjust your basal when you're running. Some people drop it a tiny bit out of habit. Um, and if you're running a long way, like ultra marathons, that's probably sensible. Uh, if you're just doing a half an hour around the block, it's probably not going to make any difference at all. Um, so if your basal is set accurately, so you can fast without raising your blood glucose or dropping your blood glucose, physical activity shouldn't be a problem. If you do a lot of hit sort of the high intensity um, interval training, or if you do a lot of sports where you've got aerobic sorry, anaerobic metabolism, so sprinting type of sports, some aggressive football games, et cetera, et cetera, rugby, obviously, in New Zealand, or whatever, um, you, you're, um, you, you will then have to burn sugar because anaerobic respiration requires sugar burning, and that may send you into a slightly higher blood glucose state. So some people who do aggressive exercise tend to raise their blood glucose. Um, and that's due to the, the hormones uh, around um, anaerobic activity or intense phys um, aerobic activity. But um, by and large, if you're on a keto diet, you can pretty well fast for an hour or so, hour and a half running. I've done loads of half marathons fully fasted. If you feel you're going hypo, just correct it with glucose. If you're doing longer distances, we talk about this a lot, possibly topping up with glucose is useful. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's, it's how you need to fuel your body. Uh, some people run out of glycogen quite quickly uh, and other people can, can retain their glycogen stores and just happily burn fat all the time. So the key here is to get your basal level accurate. And then, you know, shorter distances that are aerobic are, are pretty easy with low carb, but always carry, always carry sugar, always carry a means of, of um, testing your blood glucose. And don't forget that um, CGMs fall off, especially if they're rubbing a lot on, um, on your belt or you, you knock them quite a lot, depending on the sport you're doing. Um, so we, we, we find that the guys who have done the, the 05100, we didn't have any problems at all. On day two, we, our, our insulin levels dropped. So if you're doing prolonged physical activity, you, you will find that your basal requirements will drop. So a friend of mine, is in Mallorca at the moment, John, who did, who was on that, that 0 for 100, he's cycling at the moment, and he's taking no basal insulin at all um, for the next five days. He's gone down from something like 16 units to four. Now he's decided he's not taking basal because his insulin sensitivity has improved with, with exercise. But that's over an eight hour cycling day. Um, so just bear that in mind that if you're doing prolonged activity, say if you're having a week of a trek or something, you might find your basal requirements reduce, which is interesting in itself. And is there a bit of an adaptation time for this? You know, how long did it take you to get confident, you know, to do fasted exercise? Uh, I, I did a series of one monthly half marathons. And after my third one, I was confident mm. because I was in the mentality that you have to feel for activity. Then I suddenly thought, well, why do you feel for activity? Because you're actually only running because you're going to try to catch that antelope or something. <laughs> so you're hungry. You're only running because you're hungry, if you see what I mean. And um, that was a bit of a revelation. Then it was a fat-fueled um, activity. And then I thought, well, I don't really need anything at all. And then it was a, a fasted activity. Mm -hmm. So I did, I don't know, 12 half marathons in 12 months, which is amazing for me because I could only normally manage about one or two a year when I was on a high-carb diet. But, but with that, um, uh, the last eight, whatever, were, were fully fasted with no problems at all. But one or two, there was a little bit of hypo going on, and that required correction. 
And I think one of them, the glucose went up to about 12 and that required a correction afterwards, but I let it, I let it drift um, throughout the event. Mm. And I'm not a fast runner by any means. I'm, I'm definitely aerobic. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's not difficult to do if you, if you, if you understand your, your particular requirements for physical activity. And if you're doing very prolonged uh, um, activity like these ultra marathons, you, you probably need to reduce your, your basal, but not by much. Mm. Experiment it, with. Mm. And don't be, don't be afraid of it. And don't be afraid to have some carbs if you need them or to have a little bit more insulin if you need it. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 There's no rigid rules, I think, is the... Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's all personal. Everything's personal. Everyone's so different with, with type 1 diabetes. And as you were saying, Susan, everyone's different in how they handle the various types of food. No, no. All right. You don't need to go around with, with stacks and stacks of glucose gels all around your body. Um, you're yep. unlikely to need much. Mm. Great. And what a great... Um, what a great goal to aim for as well. So, yeah, love to hear how you get on, Quentin. Uh, Carol wants to know what carbohydrate intake should you aim for as a type 2 diabetic? I personally, if I was type 2, would aim for as low as you can go. Um, but it depends how your type 2 is, you know, how bad your type 2 is in that sense. Um, I mean, type 2 is definitely a metabolic disease. Um, and it's based around your vulnerability to, to fat storage and therefore carbohydrates, ultimately. Um, some people can get away with just reducing their carbohydrates by half. Some people need to reduce it by more. Um, if you've got obesity, fatty liver, pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, you have a metabolic vulnerability. Um, so you need to bear that in mind. So you, you, you should never overfuel your body. And if you are fueling it, I would personally fuel it on as few carbs as I can get away with. However, for some people, that isn't practical or possible. Um, so reducing ultra-processed refined carbohydrates would be my first goal um, in that situation. And then reducing my um, unrefined carbohydrates down to what level I could get away with. So what I mean get away with is you know, how crucial is that bread in the morning? And if it's crucial because you've got a, an emotional relationship with it, um, it's probably crucial for you. Um, but there are other carbs that you can you can do without because, you know, the, the, the more carbs you have, the more likely it is that your diabetes won't go into remission. Um, however, you know, it's a sliding scale. That's the thing about low carbohydrate in type 2 diabetes. It's a sliding scale for everyone. So we do get people with pre-diabetes who can just literally give up ultra-processed food biscuits or fruit juice or something like that, and then they're fine. And then they don't have type 2 diabetes or all fatty liver, and that suits them. Other people uh, will need to go down to keto levels in order to, to, to do well. So again, it's, it's, a, it's an individualized answer. The purists would say, get it, get it down to keto levels. And I think that's a, a good aim. But if you can't do that, um, you have to be practical, but ultra processed foods are the ones to give up first, uh, yeah. definitely. And then just work on the, the other carbs as, as you can and work on your relationship with carbs. And, you know, if you're really physically active, really physically active, you probably won't have type two diabetes anyway. But, you know, carbs are just fuel. They will just get fueled straight into your bloodstream, uh, straight into your muscles if you're physically active. Mm. And that's the basis for fueling for sport, isn't it? If you're physically active, you can, you can fuel with sugar. And at the pinnacle of sport, if anybody here is a, a top Olympic athlete, probably sugar fueling is going to give you that 0.1 second edge over your rivals and get you the gold medal. Mm. Um, but for the vast, vast majority of us, it's not a consideration. Mm. And I've got a book and I haven't got it in front of me and I can't quite remember the name of it, metabolic something, but it advises that we can really only cope with about 30 grams of carbs per meal anyway when even yeah. when we're in a healthy state so i would suggest you know if you're looking at cutting back at least you know that's a really good starting point that's still 90 grams of carbs a day and then monitor your blood glucose and your ketones and then you can adjust accordingly perhaps 
Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. All right. Stephanie wants to know how many meals a day should you eat? So I don't know if she's diabetic or just, you know, wanting to improve her metabolism, but you talked about two meals a day earlier. Well, there's this process called yeah. autophagy, um, which is cell repair, basically. And uh, that only kicks in at about 16 to 18 hours um, of, of fasting. And, and that is a system in your body where um, the body goes into a process of using up its waste products for itself rather than excreting them. So it makes it much easier for the body to, 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 to handle nutrients, if you like. Um, and that increases insulin sensitivity and it reduces what you call inflammation in the body. So, and uh, a lot of people think that it, it operates um, as a healthy mechanism and it's not a stress response. Um, so th there are these diets, aren't there? 16, 8, 18, 6, and all sorts in between. Some people fast for 24, 48 hours routinely. You know, um, religious um, practices in, involve fasting in a lot of cases. But for general health, I think a phase of autophagy uh, is useful. So a 16 hour fast would be what I would personally recommend based on what I've read. Um, and uh, an eight hour window of eating. So and no snacks at all. Your body does not need snacks. Mm. I think snacks are, are, are not helpful. I think having an empty gut is quite useful in the same, you know, give your gut a good rest in the same as you give your brain a good rest when you're asleep although the brain's very, very active when we're asleep. But the gut needs time to rest and, and get rid of all those hormones of eating, which, of course, are driven by, by the, the pleasure of eating food and driven by the, the brain, ultimately. Um, but you don't want a full, a full gut all the time stimulating all of these digestive hormones, of which insulin is one. So uh, at minimum, I would have thought of 16-hour fast if people can do it. There are a small number of people who are grazers and they prefer to eat on a, on a regular basis. So if you're a grazer, um, it may be that, that, that eating frequently and little suits you. Um, depends on what your metabolism is and what you're trying to achieve. But for overall health, it's cutting out um, ultra processed foods, it's cutting out all uh, artificial sweeteners. It's doing moderate physical activity all day if you can being active as much as you possibly can it's trying to be relaxed it's getting good sleep it's eating uh, uh, unrefined foods as i said um no sprays if you can get it organic where possible and uh, that will probably get you pretty well where you need to be mm. but you don't need eating non-stop it doesn't mean you shouldn't be getting your calories but it just depends on the window of opportunity for those calories you should and think about them as nutrients, people. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy your food. Enjoy your food as well. Yeah, you need your nutrients. Um, <laughs> I've been diving down the fasting window a little bit, doing quite a bit of research, <laughs> just in terms of the difference between male and female. So I think um, with the female cycle and then also going into menopause, that there can be some adjustments you can make to those fasting windows. So um, I know women, you know, their husband can fast for 72 hours, no problem at all. And they are starving and hangry and, you know, and I just think just again, come back to individualizing it. And there's certain times in our cycle where, you know, our estrogen loves low insulin um it likes longer fasts and then as we get to the end of our cycle our progesterone likes a little bit more glucose now that's not saying go crazy and you can eat anything that you want but it's just about um modifying that and managing that and again working it into your own individual system and where you're at and just taking care of those hormones that we all need to look after. Um, a question from Sue, how are we going for time? Are there any supplements you recommend for metabolic health? I'm not a diabetic. I think down there in New Zealand, I think vitamin D is quite useful. Um, I think it's an antipode and I'm say the same as us up here in the UK. Um, Vitamin D is um, 
best sort of absorbed through the sun, um, really. Um, but general view is that most people in the, the temperate latitudes are lacking in vitamin D. So what I, I'd recommend is between, do you have British summertime? You don't have British summertime. Do you have um, change in your clocks, for the winter months? Do you? Yeah. yeah, we do too. So I always say when the clocks go back to when the clocks go forward, take sort of three to 4,000 units of vitamin D per, per day as an oral supplement, because it's unlikely you're going to get the, to, to absorb it through the sun. Although the sunshine is the best route um, to get your vitamin D. Some people use vitamin C, some people use selenium. I think that there's a whole branch of nutrigenomics which will determine you know, your, your supplementation. Some people use folic acid. Um, if they're not, um, if, if they're short in it, if you're more on a vegetarian type of diet, vitamin B12 will be useful. Um, some people use zinc for absorption. Depends, depends a lot on how, how your body is, but routinely, if you're eating nutrient dense, wholesome food, you shouldn't need too much. Um, there's this, I'm not well versed on nutrigenomics, but Sarah may be, and, and Susan, you may be, um, but there's a whole branch of analyzing your DNA to see which um, biochemical pathways are a bit more vulnerable uh, than others as, as, um, uh, you know, as we become genetically individualized, if you see what I mean. So everyone's slightly different in, in how their met metabolism is expressed. Um, all the B vitamins are required for all the energy pathways. But if you're having a, a, a good diet, um, I don't think you should be too worried about supplements. Although I do know a lot of doctors who take quite a few supplements, but I'm not one of them. Um, so other people will be able to pass more comment than that. But I think vitamin D is the only one I would think about acquiring in the winter months. You may have other ideas on that, you guys. I think, I don't know what Sarah thinks. I think that I think you have to be very careful with um, vitamin D supplementation. Vitamin D itself is really important, but vitamin D and vitamin A work very synergistically. Um, they compete for the same um, receptors for uptake. So I think before you supplement, it's really important to check your levels and just make sure that you are deficient. And you know, there's been a lot of vitamin D zinc recommendations with COVID. And again, I'm very cautious of that because zinc and copper compete. Um, they're both really important. Copper is so important for the iron recycling and loading into ceruloplasmin. Um, so I just think before you do that kind of supplementation, you know, go and get some blood tests done. Make sure, just make sure you are deficient before you just start taking random supplements. And then when looking at supplements, I always look at food-based supplements. So look at things like your liver and your organ meats. Look at your whole food vitamin C, which contains all the internal complexes, not just the ascorbic acid, because all these things work synergistically. Um, so yeah, that's my recommendation, Sarah. I don't know if you have any thoughts. No, you've definitely taught me a lot because this is not my area. And I actually went off the vitamin D. I remember you telling me not so what a year ago when I was on the 5,000 units or whatever it is for, for the COVID protocol. Um, and you taught me about that, how it was blocking copper or whatever it is. And I now take cod liver oil yep. and magnesium. Yep. And I get outside every day. I get out, I try and get out first thing in the morning as the sun's rising, middle of the day, and when the sun is the sun set as well um, for the mitochondria health. So I don't take anything else but magnesium and cod liver oil, really. And that's that's it. <laughs> so I don't know. I feel fine. I haven't actually been tested for anything. So I send my clients, I talk about going to Susan for all the micronutrients because that's her her expertise. <laughs> Thank you. I second that. I second that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I love the cod liver oil. The cod liver, um, you want to get cod liver oil that hasn't got added vitamin D to it. So you want to get um, the natural cod liver oil with no nothing else. But that gives you, again, it's a food-based supplement and it gives you just that beautiful synergy of vitamin A and vitamin D together and then all your EPA and DHA for your brain health and everything. So 
All right, anyway, let's get on to the next question. Thanks, Sue, for that one. Um, Brett, got a couple more minutes. Brett wants to know, type two diabetes, long acting insulin and bolus insulin for meals, struggles between hyperglycemia and hyperglycemia. Would a low carb diet help reduce those fluctuations? I think the short answer to that is yes. Um, <laughs> but again, the same rules apply about um, getting your basal insulin exactly right for you. Um, I don't know what, about your weight and all that sort of thing, but it. No, I haven't it, got any idea. You no, know, if you're if you, if you're losing weight rapidly, your your bolus insulin level will probably uh, need to be reduced. But I, I obviously I'm not a doctor from that point of view. But but fluctuations between hypos and hypers um, are typically caused by um, too much insulin in your system, really, and then to, an overcompensation with, with carbohydrates. Um, so if you have a low carb diet, I mean, that's the main carbohydrates are the main stimulator of uh, insulin or glucose is the, the main stimulator of insulin. So um, I, th I think the, the problem here is that you I think you need to be tested to see if you're type one as well. Um, if you're getting swings of glucose it, it, it's a bit worrying as to why the, those swings are happening really you shouldn't be having too many hypos if you're type 2 on insulin unless you've actually been diagnosed as an insulin dependent type 2 uh, in which case your body's not producing too much insulin so yes low carb will help but in my experience type 2s who are on long acting and bolus actually are insulin dependent uh, and low carb strategy will, will help with that it will smooth out the peaks and troughs but if you've got a lot of natural insulin on board as well uh typically most type twos don't get the hypos they tend just to to get more normalization of glucose because they've got um because they're not insulin sensitive but it sounds like you're quite insulin sensitive to me and and i would question whether you have type one or type two or mm -hmm. if you're type two insulin dependent type two i think mm -hmm. that's probably you are if you've been put on bolus and long acting together so low carb would work for you but clearly that's something you need to discuss with your doctor and just to determine your diagnosis accurately because i've got enough information there really mm. and again i'll just um mention marcus hawkins and um, dr glenn davies who both um specialize in this kind of work so and then you can contact either Sarah or myself um, and we can put you on to other GPs around the country who may be able to help. Because I think it's really important to work with a medical doctor who really knows what they're doing with the low carb stuff. And then yeah. you know, Sarah and I come in to help with the support mm -hmm. alongside that. But we need that medical oversight as well because we can't give medical advice at all. <laughs> It's not our, it's not our skill set. All right. Oh, I love the last question. <laughs> What's your view on eating meat as a diabetic? I eat meat as a diabetic. <laughs> I think we're seeing in New Zealand, we're seeing so much anti-meat propaganda, um, meat causes diabetes, meat causes every disease there is. And um, so I guess people, are, I, I won't laugh because I will take it seriously because I'm sure it's a serious question. Um, people are getting quite concerned and nervous about eating meat. So, um, yeah, I mean, as a type one, I, uh, I think meat's very suitable, really. It's got the right proportions of protein and fat if you eat the fattier cuts of meat. And it makes life very easy to control your blood glucose, really. Oh. Um, but, you know, other people may want to try a different diet for them um, and it might work for them. And if you're on a diet for ethical reasons, well, clearly meat probably won't fit into your lifestyle. Oh. But I, I, I don't think, I mean, it depends how much meat you want to eat, doesn't it? There are some carnivorous people, with carnivorous type ones who seem to do very, very well indeed, I don't I don't think meat by itself is, is harmful. And you have to be, with research, re, modern research, I think research um, today is often sponsored uh, and you have to be a little bit careful. You have to find out who's actually paid for the research and what the agenda is. Um, and I noticed that a lot. I just, 
been reading a huge number of medical papers um, for, for the research for my um, courses. And some of them are nuanced um, towards a point of view, um, which you have to understand, you know, it's like all advertising really. And, and, and some research is, is nothing more than advertising. Um, and certainly the research that hits the headlines is often nuanced towards a point of view. Um, I don't think, I, th I think I'd have to look more in more detail at how meat impacts in disease, but people have been eating meat for years and years and years and years and years and, and type two diabetes hasn't been around for as long as people have been eating meat, if you see what I mean. So meat isn't the added factor in the generation of disease. It's wow. other foods other than meat that are causing the diseases. It's definitely not genetic drift over 50 years. Wow. It's caused by a changing our diet. Wow. And I, I think people have been eating meat for hundreds of thousands of years with, with, um, with no increase in metabolic diseases or lifestyle diseases. So it's a lifestyle issue rather than one component of that, I think. And I think well, processed foods are harmful. A lot of the studies are epidemiological epidemiological um and you know they, they might show some association but not causation and again they often use relative risk rather than actual risk just to um, exaggerate the risk and there's so many other things healthy user bias um it's what you eat with your meat um so many of these studies they might test they might be following a population of people over 15 years and they only check on what they eat once and it's a dietary Absolutely. it's a dietary recall and what did you eat how many cups of meat did you eat in the last year i mean I think generally, though, I wouldn't eat meat that's been produced for, by factory farms with with the wrong fueling for the cows or the the pigs or the chickens or whatever, because wrong fueling caught, generates meat with a fatty profile that's unhealthy. Mm. So cows cows that are fed on on soy and wheat have a different profile of fats than cows that are fed on pasture. Mm. I think that's quite an important principle, and also it's the animal welfare side of it. Yeah. And then there's the the heavy processing of meats you know, to form the sort of convenience foods, the, the sausages, the saveloys, the bacon and, and all of that, which is probably not that healthy, really, if you can get access to fresh meat. Uh, so this is, is, it's a very difficult area to, to research. And, and as you, you say, Susan, it's often done with what called epidemiological studies. I was just reading one that just came out recently. It was talking about, oh, low-carb diets are dangerous for people that you, you live less long on a low-carb diet. Well, they asked people 128 questions once and, and came to a conclusion on that. And when they drilled into what low carb actually meant, it was something like 35 to 50 percent of their energy from carbs mm. and the lower the carb. The and, and that's not low carb, mm. um, but mm. it got a headline. Mm. Um, and then it's, it's I, all, research I, is difficult. I was just reading a study the other day. And they were talking about it. And it's interesting how they frame it because they keep saying, you know, plant-based diets are healthier, or, but there's an increased risk of mental health issues on a plant-based diet because of nutrient deficiencies, you know. So, you know, I, I just find how they, how they frame it sometimes um, isn't quite that, isn't quite that accurate either you know they're still they're still trying to say eat this plant-based diet but you might need to take these supplements to make up for the nutrient deficiencies from this plant-based diet so I think mm -hmm. over the next few years more information will come out and people will get better educated and yeah I think it's individual isn't it whatever diet suits you and keeps you healthy and makes you feel vital uh is the, the, the key um yeah it's, it's a difficult issue. I, I never quote any epidemiological studies on diet, whether it's in favour of um, keto or against keto. I just don't think they're worth it. There's, there's one doing the rounds at the moment saying saturated fat is not harmful. Um, but it's when you look at the, the studies, it's, nobody's done any new studies. They've just taken old studies and rehashed them yeah. and reworked the figures to make them seem good, you know. And it's called a meta-analysis of, of epidemiological studies. And <laughs> you, you, it's really it's rarefied atmosphere stuff and and 
you know, quoting epidemiological studies out of context, I don't think helps anybody's cause. It just polarizes the debate, really. Yeah. Well, I think the work of people like Dr. David Unwin, you know, where he's presenting, you know, real life case studies. I mean, that's, that's not epidemiological, is it? That's yeah. far more, you know, that's far more helpful and enlightening. And, you know, just one thing, and just to sum up, which I'm sure that all of us here, you know, probably think about and is our approach is I'm not attached to any dietary dogma. I'm attached to what is the most healthiest thing I can do for my own health and what, how can I help my clients be as healthy as they can possibly be. And that might be different for all of us. You know, I know I've got very different genetics. I've got genetics that really predispose me to Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes. My genetics don't really sit well in our modern environment and lifestyle. So to prevent those things, I have to be very gentle and careful and look after my genetics. And um you know, we're all different. So I, I think it's not about having any dogma about a diet. It's about finding what works for you to keep you healthy. But don't just keep blaming your genes. It's how your genes interact with your environment. I don't know if you guys would like to finish up on some comments about that. And Well, yes, I mean, every... I mean, what you say, Susan, is, is completely right. I mean, it's difficult to say dogmatically uh, uh, talk dogmatically about diets um i i think the ketogenic diet is the best for type 1 diabetes because of the way it impacts on the metabolic upset caused by uh, type 1s having no insulin mm. but people with type 1 may choose to to take a, a different diet some people may choose not to eat meat for whatever reason sometimes it doesn't they don't feel it suits their bodies anyway um so I think all of this is about individual pursuit of, of your own health. Mm. Uh, it's not about dogma. I do, however, feel that you have to work with what, what you, you have. So if you have type 2 diabetes, you, you have, there, are some, there are some restrictions on, on your, your lifestyle uh, or some freedoms. Or there are restrictions that will give you freedom, if you see what I mean, from yeah. the disease. But, you know, there are other annoying people that live long and, and live in the fast lane <laughs> and they do very, very well indeed, don't they? And, and good for them. Yeah. It, it, so it's, it's individual is mm. the key. Yeah. Sarah, would you like to have the last word? <laughs> um, no, it's just been really informative because type 1 is definitely not something that I'm very familiar with. I've only had one type 1 diabetic and she came to me not, so much to be on keto she did end up going keto but we started off just with she just wanted to create some healthy habits and then she she was already low carb and she started just dabbling in keto I was a bit nervous to be honest because I hadn't sort of played around with that area as kind of type 2 and insulin resistance so but she was a pro with her insulin she's like I know what I'm doing I can just change my insulin when needed and so she just played around and I just sort of coached her with the whole you know healthy fats and you know reducing the carbs and just keep checking her her blood glucose and she just kind of monitored it and it, and it was good and she she was doing great on the keto diet so no tonight's been really good and um I agree with you know with the diet thing not diet thing but the food thing about being individual and I'm a huge fan of um I mean I'm mainly carnivore now but the ketogenic lifestyle for um, neurological conditions, you know, people that have got um, Parkinson's and all those, I think that they can do really, really well on a very sort of high, high fat ketogenic lifestyle um, and type two diabetics as well. Um, but some people do great on low carb and they're fine with that. But I think everyone benefits from cutting out processed food. We're eating far too many carbohydrates and sugars. Um, nobody, nobody needs that. Um, and snacking as well. Not a fan of snacking for anyone really. <laughs> Um, and, and I do like the whole time restricted eating, fasting again, I'm like Susan, um, and I've been dabbling and sort of going deeper with the whole hormones and women um, and, we, you know, around our cycles and stuff um, and nurturing that kind of um, phase with women's cycles, because I believe that fasting can sometimes mess up your hormones if you're a woman. 
but it can also, um, if you do it at the wrong time, and that's what I'm sort of just um, trialing myself at the moment, just getting into my perimenopausal stage now. Um, and I've done years of fasting, but I've actually changing the way I, I do it now for myself um, because I feel like I'm, I'm older now and I don't think what I did before was working. So I'm actually doing less fasting, but I still do time restricted eating um, and having that sort of 16 hours without food because I do, that does work really well. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you both so much. I'll put all your contact details in the um, in the show notes and send you the links once this is published on YouTube. Thanks to everybody who came and amazing questions. Really good questions tonight. Um, Ian, you've gone way beyond <laughs> the call of duty. So I really appreciate your time and um, the for listening. quality of your answers. So thanks very much everybody.